trying to predict the future is a discouraging and hazardous occupation. The only thing we can be sure of about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic. Let's start by looking at the city of the future. Some people think it will be like this. But what about the city of the day after tomorrow? Say, the year 2000. I think it will be completely different. I'm thinking of the incredible breakthrough which has been made possible by developments in communications, particularly the transistor and, above all, the communication satellite. These things will make possible a world in which we can be in instant contact with each other, wherever we may be, where we can contact our friends anywhere on Earth. It will be possible in that age, perhaps only 50 years from now, for a man to conduct his business from Tahiti or Bali just as well as he could from London. In fact, men will no longer commute. They will communicate. They won't have to travel for business anymore. They'll only travel for pleasure. of all wars came to an end. After World War II, many nations around the world got back on their feet and started to rebuild their countries. But another conflict emerged, the infamous Cold War. Sebelum ini yang menguasai dunia adalah British dan Amerika. Soviet Union tidak menguasai dunia. Mereka bersaing untuk mendapatkan kuasa yang baru. Siapa yang bakal menguasai dunia? Yang menggerakkan perang ini adalah perang propaganda. Propaganda mencapai tahap kemuncaknya ketika perang dingin ini. Medium utama yang digunakan ialah komunikasi. During this time, there was an intense display of military might among the world's two superpowers. Each wanted to forge ahead with their military technology. But that was not enough. Setelah menguasai daratan, mereka perlu menguasai selangkah di hadapan. Apa selangkah di hadapan? Naik ke udara, naik ke angkasa. Kerana di angkasa, mereka dapat menguasai keseluruhan ruang, eh? keseluruhan bumi itu. One of the pursuits by the two countries was to develop spacecrafts to be sent out into space. A futurist and inventor, Arthur C. Clarke, had envisioned an orbit where man-made objects could be placed thousands of kilometers above the Earth's surface. We've just come out of a war, a major global conflict. How will we find the resources to do the kinds of things that people like Clark were pointing to, right? And you needed some deep and powerful motivation to do that. So his reflections were to kind of enhance the capability of humans to communicate with one another. And the key resource, right, to develop initially was the ability to build a rocket. Today, a new moon is in the sky, a 23-inch metal sphere placed in orbit by a Russian rocket. You are hearing the actual signals transmitted by the Earth-circling satellite, one of the great scientific feats of the age. Pelajaran Sputnik pada tahun 1957, eh, Oktober 1957, adalah untuk menunjukkan kepada dunia bahawa Rusia lebih maju daripada Amerika Syarikat. Eh, maka mereka mendapat skor yang pertama. There was a very deep perception that the U.S. science and technical effort simply was not sufficient and had fallen behind the Soviet Union. And at the same time, though, it was also, you know, perhaps somewhat strangely and counterintuitive, uh, seen as a moment of intense celebration. Here, after decades and at least a couple of centuries, where people, through science fiction writing, dreamed about going into space. 
Sputnik circled the Earth. It crossed over many, many nations and countries. It emitted this, you know, kind of signature beep, beep, beep that, you know, people in any part of the world could pick up with the right kind of radio antenna. So was there, there was a kind of excitement around it, too. As the two superpowers were deeply engaged in the space race, another interesting development was taking place. So it was the 1960s that both set the course of, of development of the different types of satellites and the satellites were just this very, very important tool for many, many different kinds of human activities, both peaceful and associated with war. The 60s was a pivotal decade when Arthur C. Clarke's formula of geostationary orbit first gained recognition. Geostationary orbit is 36,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface. Satellites that are placed there appear stationary according to their geographical location on Earth. Geostationary orbit became a focus of Clark's as he thought about the question, how do you provide communication capability and services to people, governments, businesses on a very large planetary scale? And one could attempt to do this in a ground-based fashion with cables and telephone towers. But a much more efficient and capable way to do this was to point out that if you were able to get a communications device, a satellite in Earth orbit, this kind of ambition, this kind of goal could be realized. Technicians in Europe prepare to receive a signal from the orbiting Telstar satellite that opens this new era. This is the first formal exchange of an official transmission, a beaming of the presidential press conference to the continent where most of Europe can witness democracy at work. The president has these historic words. I understand that part of today's press conference is being relayed by the Telstar communications satellite to viewers across the Atlantic. And uh, this is another indication of the extraordinary world in which we live. This was one of the most significant milestones in satellite communication history. So the idea that you could use a satellite to send a signal up, say, from the United States, and then have the satellite beam it down to another location, provided this dramatic sort of sense of how much faster communications would be, how much uh, different kinds of information and entertainment could be done via satellites. The United States continued to prove that they were a force to be reckoned with. Tahun 1969, eh, Amerika merasakan bahawa mereka perlu menyaingi Rusia dan menghantar, iaitu Neil Armstrong. Manusia pertama yang menjejakkan kaki di bulan. Dan tambahan pula Amerika Syarikat menyiarkan peristiwa pendaratan Neil Armstrong itu secara langsung ke dunia. Maka di sinilah tercetusnya satu persaingan yang hebat sehingga kemudiannya dalam tahun-tahun yang berikutnya dunia ini dipenuhi dengan satelit. Decades later, and the world that Clark predicted is really not that much different. An online content maker from Malaysia is about to make his next travel video. Hey, hey, Assalamualaikum. Selamat datang ke Bukit Sapu Tangan. Yeah. Nama saya Fikri Zamri. Saya seorang travel content creator. Saya start buat YouTube daripada tahun 2020 sampai sekarang saya buat banyak konten pasal hidden gems kat seluruh Malaysia. Dalam dunia konten kereta ni saya rasa internet memang salah satu benda yang memang wajib ada sebab kita 100% guna internet untuk bisnes. Time saya research pun saya memang pakai internet daripada saya pre video tu sampai saya post video tu. 
Masa pre saya akan gunakan untuk macam research Masa pergi contoh bila saya masuk hutan Saya akan pakai satu app app ni Untuk track saya betul ke tak jalan yang saya masuk tu Dengan internet saya rasa macam Saya lebih confident lah sebenarnya bila masuk hutan Tengah-tengah shoot kadang-kadang jadi jadi sesuatu benda Masa tengah shoot yang tak diduga Macam dulu saya pernah naik, plan nak naik Gunung Kinabalu It is the tallest mountain in Malaysia and a feat to reach the summit. The location is far from the city and internet connection is hard to come by. Tahun 2020, masa tu time merdeka. Kita orang dah plan setahun dengan kawan-kawan untuk buat vlog nak pergi Gunung Kinabalu sambut merdeka kat sana. So ada kawan saya ni dia suggest malam gunung. Bila sampai kat Kundasang, kita orang pusing-pusing Kundasang kita call dia tak dapat, dia tak angkat. Habis tu yang duit duit awak tu terpaksa saya refund lah besok. Okey okey okey. Ha awak yang ada insyaallah tapi yang saya takutnya sebenarnya saya ni DKL. Ha? Abang kaget eh? DKL. <laughs> Tapi sebenarnya dia macam ditipu lah. Kalau lah kita ada internet ke malam tu, kita maybe boleh cari backup ke awal, tanya siapa-siapa ada slot kosong ke tak. So, kita tak tahu nak buat apa lah sebenarnya malam tu. Kita orang uh, nak call siapa-siapa pun tak ada line. Left deserted and with no internet connection, Fikri and his friends had no choice but to cancel their plans. A geopolitical conflict was still brewing in the 60s. In an attempt to boost morale, hopeful scenes from around the world were broadcasted via satellite to 14 countries. In 43 control rooms all around the world, production teams are monitoring and selecting the hundreds of pictures and sounds from five continents, which will combine to make this historic program. One of them was to kind of focus on newborns, you know, babies being born in different parts of the world with the question is, what kind of present are they being born into? What kind of future will they have? A live concert by the chart-topping band The Beatles was also aired to strengthen the message of hope. They had a whole group of musicians and singers as part of the setup to share with audiences around the world. So, I mean, I think, you know, this messaging was a, you know, kind of both a marker of, wow, look how far communication satellites have come. We'll look at the possibilities in terms of everyday life. Soon, satellite technology started to be adopted elsewhere around the world, especially in developing nations. As you get into the 1990s, you begin much more exploration of using other types of orbits, both for communications as well as for new technologies for navigation and positioning systems in the United States, right? GPS is the terminology for that. In the early 1990s, Malaysia, a rapidly developing Southeast Asian country, needed to improve their communication infrastructure. Saya ingat telefon pun belum begitu canggih dan maju lagi ya. Kita mesti pakai telegraf dan ada telefon lain dan sebagainya. Jadi kita melihat negara maju, dia telah mampu menggunakan komunikasi yang lebih baik. Telecommunication companies were ready to offer their services, but they were confronted with many challenges. Mobile technology, when it came about, basically said we could do that in a, in a smaller scale. We, we could just put towers nearby and connect all those towers and people could, could be connected. 
I would say in the 90s, when the world was moving into more of this multimedia sort of experience where television content was very important means to disseminate information. I think the country realized that it would take ages to put all those towers and cables in place to connect, you know, 20, 25, 30 million Malaysians. Apabila kita melihat perkembangan teknologi ini begitu pantas, maka negara telah mula mengorak langkah supaya kita juga tidak harus menjadi pengguna semata-mata 100%. A government initiative was launched. Their target, accelerate the nation's information and communication technology. The MSC will have the best physical infrastructure that can be offered in the world. However, the present infrastructure was not in line with the ambition of a rapidly developing country. One of the first ideas to speed up the growth was to mark a spot for Malaysia in space. With satellite, imagine you bring the whole coverage of Malaysia to 100% coverage. So you just have a small dish without interference and you, need, you don't need to put on the roof, just as far as you see the satellite. And then now it's just a question of turning on the magic and getting the communications and content out to the people. A private Malaysian company took the initiative and funded the project. Somebody said, we don't know why Malaysia, small countries, uh, want to have this kind of uh, technology. I said it's not business of that country because we have uh, money, we have, can do whatever we want. But we have to have a business plan which we came with uh, Astro, we came with Maxis. Tapi oleh kerana teknologi ini semakin maju, ada ruang-ruang pengkomersialan boleh diteroka. Jadi inilah juga antara penyebab banyak negara di dunia, bukan saja Malaysia, mula meneroka kepada apa yang dipanggil perkongsian antara public and private partnership. The work to develop the satellite began in 1992, but there were challenges ahead. They said, if we want a satellite, we want first environmentally friendly. So two meter dishes means it's not acceptable. So in order to reduce the dish, we have to move the band. A higher frequency radio wave had to be used in order to minimize the size of the satellite dishes. Censorship was also a main issue. Unsupervised content could spark a racial or religious conflict in multiracial Malaysia. But there were also other concerns. The public were cautious about the newly introduced communication satellite technology. The satellite sits 36,000 kilometers uh, above the Earth. You can't see it with the naked eye. You rely on technology, physics, and pure faith, I guess, in a sense, to know that it's there. It's not there for us to see, but now we have to convince people how it works. Kita lihat masa internet dahulu ya, bila kerajaan mula memperkenalkan apa itu internet dan bagaimana nak menggunakan internet, kita menerima tentangan yang cukup hebat. Begitu juga satelit, ya, kos dia begitu besar. Jadi ini merupakan juga salah satu daripada cabaran-cabaran yang diterima oleh negara. After a few years of deliberation and regulations set by the government, finally, the first two Malaysian communication satellites were set to be built. The people responsible for this multi-billion ringgit project were under a lot of pressure. The satellite industry is zero mistake. Any mistake, you may lose the satellite, which is 15 years, 18 years of life. There is no access to it. Somebody go up there and fix the thing. So it's very important to be sure everything is okay. Set, six, seven, four, three, two, one, top. Allumage, ignition, décollage, lift off.
Malaysia made history in January 1996 by launching their first communication satellite, Miasat-1, into space. This success was followed by the second one, Miasat-2, in November of that year. Both launches marked a major milestone in Malaysia's telecommunication history. Satellites are, are very purpose-built. They, they, they are very design-focused and they have a specific mission like. The first one, Miasat-1, very clear. We wanted to enable direct-to-home services, broadcast those services over Malaysia, and that was its specific function. Once in orbit, the new satellites were ready to showcase their capability. We launched the direct-to-home services that basically transformed you know, the whole new world to, at least from a Malaysian perspective, that you know, we got to see all the different channels. In the 90s, you would have relied on a, like a fishbone antenna, put it on your roof, and you could receive one or two channels. But then the direct-to-home service, like Astro, came about, and suddenly with just one appliance, you were able to receive hundreds of channels. Once you uplink to the satellite, whoever that within the footprint itself will be able to receive the content. Broadcaster, they will transmit the content of the program, for example, CNN or TM or TV3 to the satellite. Then a user, you know, within the footprint itself, you know, just pull up a, a small dish, then they can start to receive the content and watch the program. This new service proved to be a hit among Malaysians. Satellite technology certainly improved the day-to-day -day life of Malaysians. But this space communication device also proved that it could go above and beyond the confines of home entertainment. When we are talking about this period of time, you're talking about the iPhone uh, just being created, 4G just being started, and that revolutionised things, you know, how you would communicate with this device, this personal device. And that created a bit of a broadband boom. So the country needed and was very hungry for broadband. We love to have our fibre services, which is essentially a cable to our home, but it will take years and years for the cables to reach every home in Malaysia. As Malaysia was rapidly growing, the government needed to satisfy its citizens' need for a faster, not to mention much more reliable internet coverage. The digital gap was there and it was growing. There were still a lot of Malaysians not connected to um, the type of uh, services that you and I take for granted. So that became a very big focus on how can we make this service available for the rural people in Malaysia and the people who, what we call, are underserved. My name is Benny Ingit. I'm a semi-retired bank officer. After 20 years plus working, I feel that we have more than enough to, to take care of ourselves, but why not do something for the community? In the rural community, there's a lot of things need to be done to improve their life. And uh, one of the things that I notice is no, no proper internet connection for the rural community. It impacts them a lot. We have quite a lot of the people. If they are not well, if they need to go to the hospital, they need to contact their children in town to bring them. They are not able to do it freely. It is a typical Sunday morning in the rural part of Sarawak. Community gatherings such as this one brings about a sense of belonging and spiritual fulfilment. Oh, 
But there is also another reason for this time of the week. At the moment, the only spot that can access internet connection is on top of the mountain, which happened to be a church. So immediately after church service, they all clock around the, the church. Some of the older people, they start to connect with their children. For a small family in this village, getting connected is a common everyday challenge. Children are also not spared from this regular day-to-day -day struggle. There are times that they have to do the homework. It involves searching through uh, YouTube or internet, but they are not able to do that. For example, if they want to learn about how other students are doing in other part of the school or other, other in, in town, they're totally cut off. So their understanding, their exposure are very limited to only this village uh, exposure. The other one is on business side. Yeah, we had the fish, but we are not able to announce to the community around our area or even uh, in town. If we have the internet, we can connect with few people who are surrounding, so they can order, they can just deliver. In the late 2000s, with the continued success of their communication services, such as direct-to-home entertainment, the Malaysian satellite company Mirsat has pledged to boost their fleet of spacecrafts. This endeavour would also include providing essential communication services to their clients. We go out, work with partners to connect areas where typically they can't be connected. So oil platforms, marine vessels, islands, remote communities, mining areas, plantations. There are a lot of areas there where still require connectivity for one reason or the other. And our job is to find those areas and, and make sure we can provide them with a, a adequate service. In line with their ambitious plan, Mirsat was set to launch their fifth satellite in 2014. We also start to look at you know, uh, how to provide more capacity to meet the demand and how we can you know, provide uh, redundancy to the uh, service. So that is all you know, happening at the same time. Capitalising on their growing need for internet access in Malaysia, Mirsa decided to broaden their service offerings. Their main focus was to provide reliable communication access in the rural areas around the country. And so we spent a lot of time tweaking, thinking about the technology, thinking about the remote equipment, who did we need to serve, how could we serve them cost-effectively. And they believed that this was an untapped market not explored fully by existing mobile companies. Telco, they don't think make any business sense for them, mainly because of like their cost is high and also the, you know, the technology that they have is not suitable for the certain area. Satellite can basically can just pinpoint to a certain area and the cost to set up itself is uh, relatively you know, cheaper. The year 2018 witnessed the birth of Mirsat's consumer broadband internet service. Exciting news for locals in rural areas who had been plagued by unreliable internet services for far too long. 
in the past, you know, if they want to get any access, they have to walk out like a few kilometers out from their village in order to just get some message or whatnot. Or sometimes they just have to like, you know, hang up the phone really high and hopefully that, you know, the signal come up and they get the, the, the message. They feel like we have made a difference in their lives. And that's what I think we're going to set out to do. We just affirm the fact and made it very clear on our decision that anything Miasat were to build next had to be towards the broadband agenda. And drove us immediately to start to think about, hey, our next satellite has to have a very large broadband component in it. So they acted on it. The blueprint for their next spacecraft was put in place with a goal of launching a stronger and more robust satellite within the next two years. So along the planning itself, we also start to see that, you know, the high demand on the broadband. So we start to tweak the design, change the, the, the requirement to make sure that, you know, whatever the design will be relevant for the next foreseeable future. The satellite was to be called Miasat 3D. This satellite would also be capable of providing a much more superior experience to their director home entertainment clients. So they are able to deploy a higher compression technology and with that itself, they can launch the 4K channel, 8K channel. So no problem that we can support the, those requirements. Rural broadband customers are no longer deprived of reliable internet services. They can expect faster connections that would be on par with urban areas. From the 30 megabit per second today, we will, with the new satellite, we're going to increase it like three times to 100 megabits. 100 megabits of the broadband speed is kind of like 5G equivalent type of speed. Hopefully, you know, with this 3D itself, we're going to hear less on the people have to climb to the tree to, to kind of get a signal or whatnot. One key thing is the education, which we hope that Bimea as a 3D itself is going to transform the life of the remote area. One of the world's leading satellite manufacturers had undertaken the job of building Miasat 3D. Construction of the project began back in 2019. Their factory in France was the location for this highly anticipated spacecraft. This is Malaysia's Cameron Highlands, famous for its holiday resorts and vegetable farms. This vast, cooler climate area is far removed from major cities. Unconnected with cable internet services, this vegetable farm has been using Mirsat internet service for years now. Before internet connection was installed, the farm had encountered several incidents which could have been dealt with immediately should they have had a reliable connection. 一个一个case啦 
自从啊有 Internet 过后，啊，工人他们也比较方便联系到他们的家人哦，因为他们现在也是用那个呃 smartphone 啊，上网啊，他们也是可以第一时间啊，他们也可以了解到他们家人的状况。Perintah kawalan pergerakan yang diumumkan oleh Perdana Menteri berkuat kuasa mulai tengah malam ini iaitu 18 Mac hingga 31 Mac. While the work for building the new satellite was underway, the world was stunned by a global health crisis. Early 2020 saw most part of the world under lockdown because of a widespread flu-like disease. This disrupted the launch of Mirsat 3D, which was due out later that year. I remember writing the, one of the papers to the to the boards when we were trying to get Mirsat 3D approved. I do not recall us writing down uh, pandemic as one of the risks that we had to to mitigate. <laughs> After two years of delay, the satellite has arrived in the plain lands of South America for its long-awaited launch. For Malaysian satellite veteran Dr. Ali Ebadi, this is the most anticipated moment of any satellite launch. Our feeling is always rocket to follow that trajectory. We launched something for 18 years. You must be excited because uh, this is your baby. I think to be very honest, I'm quite nervous. But at the same time, I'm also confident in the sense that, you know, we have a very dedicated team and we also have a very reliable manufacturer, uh, Airbus, on this. And of course, uh, Arvin is the launcher. As Mirsat 3D is released above the Earth's atmosphere, it begins its 10-day journey before it finally settles into orbit. Then, the satellite is ready to serve the people of Malaysia and beyond. 
through our efforts in developing these technologies, whether human-based or robotic, we've created this infrastructure that was above the surface of the planet of the Earth. We've created this capability that people almost everywhere can take advantage of calling a family member, doing some business, you know, watching a video that, you know, has been created in China or in Europe or South America. It's like right there at your fingertip. Sampai ke Tasik Mira. For internet users like Fikri, Benny, and Vincent, by having reliable connections in their daily lives, the world is a much better place for them. Let me present to you Orang Orang Village. Yeah. Kau tinggi sangat dah, dah sikit. Yeah. Ah, yeah. <laughs> More than 70 years ago, futurist and inventor Arthur C. Clarke envisioned a world where communication technology transformed our lives. His prophecy is a true testament of where we are today. Look at the incredible changes we've experienced and survived from the Stone Age to the present time. And yet even greater changes are still to come. And that is why the future is so endlessly fascinating. Because try as we can, we'll never outguess it. <laughs> 